Thank you everyone for joining us for today's webinar that is part of our e-commerce and digital marketing series. Innovate Hawaii is part of the Hawaii Technology Development Corporation, HTDC, which is a state agency attached to, to the Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism, whose mission is to grow the tech economy and workforce in Hawaii. Innovate Hawaii is the state's NIST Manufacturing Extension Partnership Center, which supports small and medium-sized manufacturers to enhance their productivity, growth, and technical performance through programs and services across the islands. My name is Nicole, and I am a project engineer here at HTDC Innovate Hawaii. Some housekeeping items before we dive into the webinar. This session will be recorded and will be sent to all who registered. And we are already in webinar mode, so your cameras and microphones should be muted. And feel free to send in your questions during the session through the Q&A function. So today we have Paolo Vidali, CEO and owner of Hidden Gears. Paolo founded Hidden Gears in 2012 with a deep experience in both pay-per-click advertising strategy and e-commerce web development. His expertise has been featured in CIO Magazine, Mashable, and Search Engine Journal, and he has been a national conference speaker on PPC and a conversion rate optimization. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Paulo um, to take the lead for today's session. Hi, Paulo. Thanks so much. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming, and uh, great to see you as well, Nicole. So um, there are a couple sort of premises that we're working with um, for this webinar in Google Shopping. Number one is that you have, or at least plan on having an online store. Um, Google Shopping is a ad format that is unique to e-commerce. So uh, if you don't have products that are shoppable and purchasable on a website, um, you can't really use it. So assuming all of you folks have some experience with e-commerce, have stores, um, maybe you're manufacturing goods and you've set up something um, during COVID, maybe you've been a direct to consumer sort of online brand for years, um, no matter sort of what your level, there is something to be gained uh, today because what I'll show you is going through and setting up a Google Shopping feed, but the feed actually can be used uh, for free listings as well as paid listings. So if nothing else, even if you really don't have the funds to start advertising right away, there are some benefits of actually going through and doing this process. So what I'm gonna do today is walk you through um, a presentation deck that has a lot of screenshots of various accounts that I work on with that information redacted. So unfortunately I can't sort of show you a live demo of accounts that I work on because there's uh, you know, client information in there and so forth, but I've screenshotted some stuff pulled it out and sort of provided that as context with some steps here. And then also take you into the back end of a, a demo Shopify store to show you a little bit of a hands-on um, in terms of how to set up a new um, shopping feed. So um, what we'll cover today is like, what are shopping ads? Uh, where do they appear? How do they appear? Um, what's the difference between a smart campaign and a standard shopping campaign. You may have heard news of either one of those. It used to be that standard was just sort of the original Google shopping that existed years ago and smart has come out within the last couple of years. Uh, we'll go through that and sort of in advantages and disadvantages of both. Um, how to set up a feed, what a feed is um, and sort of where you need to go to handle all of that and how to link a Shopify store in this case I'll be using Shopify as an example um, as I'm Shopify expert and partner, but um, if you had another storefront on a different platform, there's also other ways to connect to your feed. And um, sort of a brief intro on sort of how to approach ad management. Uh, there's a lot of things that are unique about shopping. So even if you have experience in other types of ad campaigns, um, it may not sort of translate into how to approach shopping. It's um, a sort of, um, yeah, it's, a, it's just a different format. So it requires its own lens and sort of framework as well. So what are shopping ads? 
um, at a very base minimum, you need a product feed that will have a product image, product name, the price, and the name of your store. Um, in the screenshot, you can see that there's also extra stuff that can happen. So um, the West Elm example here, it's just the image, the name, and a price. It's pretty basic, uh, but you can see some of these other images uh, also have labels like there's curbside pickup, or you can pick it up in person, or there's uh, star reviews, or there's a a uh, shipping incentive, or there's something that's actually on sale and it's badged to show that it's on sale as well as showing a strike through price. All of those are layers that can happen um, on top of the basic feed and Google will detect things like a, a price change or a uh, compare at price in your feed and, and automatically handle some of these as well. We also uh, have different experiences depending on what device we're on. So here's an example of how a shopping ad search might come up on a desktop device. We can see done a search before I even see any other ads or any organic content, there's a carousel and you're probably familiar with this. Again, we can see there's some shipping promos, some star reviews, et cetera. But actually if I'm on a desktop and I hover on that, there's more that can pop out. So you get a longer description you can see that this Bonobo's product actually didn't show free shipping. It showed the star reviews first, but once I hover on it, it says there's free shipping and also a special call out about the return policy. So depending on what format you're on in terms of the device you're on, um, you can get different sort of levels of information out of a shopping ad. On mobile, also it's important to remember the shopping ad is not necessarily the first thing. So on desktop, they typically are. Google sometimes plays around with where these appear on a page in testing. On mobile, this was about three sort of swipes down in this search result um, before I actually hit a shopping ad carousel. So it depends on how specific your search is um, and what device you're on as well. And you may also have seen some ads around the web, which we know as retargeting ads. So um, I went to a website of this company um, on the KITV.com site, and I see that there's this carousel of image images, some of which I may have looked at, some of which I didn't with a brand name. So a smart shopping campaign will additionally give you extra visibility outside of just the shopping carousels within search. Um, and they will uh, provide that extra visibility throughout the web, which you may or may not want. So basically Google Shopping is all about a feed configuration. So what a feed really is, is it's a, it could be a file uh, that is updated with all of your product data and it's a link to the product. It's the price, it's the name, it's a SKU, it's uh, you know that additional data like you know is there a sale, um, is there reviews associated with it, etc. Um, there's apps that you can sort of plug into your store that will automatically take the products that you have available on your site, go through, format them the correct way, and just provide um, a URL that you can just pop into Google Mer Merchant Center and it sort of does that for you. Um, and there's also an option where you can have Google crawl your site and interpret your different product pages and pull out and extract that data for you if for some reason you had a problem with another type of feed. Um, so a feed is, is essentially a, a, a long list of your, your product information. Um, this also should be either dynamically updated or very uh, frequently updated. So if something goes out of stock on your site, that should be reflected in the feed as soon as possible so you're not driving ads to something that someone can't buy. Um, the slightly convoluted part about all of this is that you have Google ads on the one hand where you're actually creating a campaign and you're booking those, um, those campaigns and you're sort of setting it up and you're spending the money in Google ads. But the feed is connected to Google Merchant Center, which is in turn connected to Google ads and that in turn needs to connect to your store. So there's a lot of different layers uh, that need to be linked together. And so we'll walk through a little later on and sort of how those all interconnect. 
Um, as I mentioned in the beginning too, you can get organic listings, uh, which are free, as well as the sort of pay for visibility of catalog placement. Um, so it is worth wading through this just if nothing else to get the free listings um, because you'll just get extra product visibility for your store. Here's an example of a free listing on mobile. You may have seen some of these already. You can notice that as opposed to the previous formats that I showed, um, the, it's, a, it's a little different format. You can see there's these categories up on top. You can see that there's these sort of indicators, there's highlighted information. It's a bit taller. Um, the stores have little logos here instead of just the name. It's a slightly larger format. Here's a press clipping. So what Google is doing is they're recognizing that all these different stores have the information syndicated to them. Um, but outside of the ad campaigns, they're saying, well, actually, this is pretty relevant. We're just going to show this. And we're also going to throw in some other stuff that we feel is relevant. You may have noticed that I'm indicating that Google is doing a lot of this thinking for you. And that's one of the key things about shopping campaigns is the level of control you have over this type of ad. Um, is much more limited compared to what you may be used to. Uh, the other thing to note with the free listings is it really actually is free. This is something that Google announced um, as sort of part of their deal with the EU antitrust legislation or laws um, that came out. They're trying to do more for retailers without locking people into a pay to play environment. This is a screenshot from one of our clients. You can see that the date range here is a single week and they've gotten 23,000 impressions. That means that essentially a, a product ad with an image has shown up in 23,000 different searches for free in addition to whatever else they have in terms of the standard Google search results. Um, you know, your mileage may vary in terms of like, well, what does that turn into in terms of clicks or sales or so forth? But that potentially is actually a lot of free traffic. Um, and that's real, why it's really worth it to hook it up um, to Google Merchant Center for that reason. You'll also see if you have free listings as well as ads in Google Merchant Center, you'll get these sort of granular uh, info boxes that say based on the, the date range, you know, how much visibility you have, how many products were listed in the free feed versus the shopping feed. I don't know why these are sort of crisscrossed, but uh, you know, how many impressions and clicks did you get for your free listings versus the shopping ones? So you'll also be able to see over time, even if you start running the paid ads, um, how much free visibility you're getting on top of that, which is nice. Um, there's other things you can do in terms of making the ads more enticing. So promotion extensions, something you might be familiar with from Google search campaigns, for instance, um, so if you're running a sale, either a direct markdown or a coupon code based offer, or you want to actually have a shopping campaign based ad where, hey, if people come in through Google Shopping, we're going to give them 10% off or $5 off or whatever, um, you can actually set that up and add that in Google Ads so that that will show up with a little coupon icon in your shopping feed. And that's a way that, again, you can stand out from the crowd in that comparison. Um, as well, you should know that Google is actually crawling your site to verify that that coupon is valid. So if Google detects a price change like a markdown or a, you've indicated there's a coupon in use or something of that nature, Google will have a Google Shopping crawler uh, similar to the organic search crawler that will actually go through and click on things and add them to the cart and apply the coupon in checkout to make sure that it's valid. So they really want to make sure that if you're, even if you're paying to advertise something, that there's that truth in that advertising and that's actually available folks. And that's the same case for uh, shipping rates as well. If you say, hey, there's free shipping over $100 and it ends up in your product feed, well, Google's actually going to test and see if that shipping rate is available in checkout. Um, it, should it find a discrepancy, your shopping ads would be uh, flagged and disapproved and, and taken offline. Uh, you'd obviously have a, a chance to um, refresh those and resubmit them, but for, for the moment, it would flag them. The other important thing to note in considering Google Shopping is it really is a baseline minimum of $1,000 spend for the placement algorithm to be effective. So. Uh, though Google Shopping is a search-driven 
platform. So it's what Google Shopping does is they basically look at all your product description, the info, the title, the pricing, the categories, anything else you've given it your website, and it's gonna determine the search queries that match that result and the shopping intent of the person as they were searching for that. Um, in order for that all to function, Google needs to chew on a good amount of data and spend, um, typically we'd see at least $1,000 a month. Um, that's even if you have a fairly niche, you know, smaller catalog, um, you could try to, you know, experiment with amounts of maybe 500 a month. Um, but honestly, in, in our experience, um, what we see is that Google sort of sends us that in the world and they kind of stall and they don't get traction. You don't even end up spending that, that amount. Um, there is a baseline for success um, with shopping because it needs to cast a wide net, get a lot of data points from the folks that are clicking and searching on those ads, and then uh, sort of honing in where they're showing it and to whom. So um, smart shopping is something that's come out in the last couple of years. Uh, this handy little chart sort of said everything I was gonna say about it, so I just included it here. So the difference really is a smart shopping campaign. Anybody can set up pretty quickly. It's not gonna ask you a lot of questions. It's not gonna have a lot of settings. Um, Google just sort of figures it out and said, okay, well, I'll just take your products and do this and that with them. What it means is that um, it will limit your ability to location target. So with a, a standard shopping campaign, you might say, hey, I want to have a 10% bid adjustment for people in California on these days. Smart shopping, you're not gonna be able to do that. Smart shopping is to still say, hey, I don't want this ad to run in Louisiana, or I do want it to run in California or Hawaii, but it's not gonna get very much more nuanced than that. Um, you cannot add negative keywords in a smart shopping campaign. So if you've run a Google search campaign before, you may know that um, a negative keyword is a way to block a specific query for those ads. Um, you can do that in standard shopping, but you can't in smart shopping. Um, and you can't do really the nuanced scheduling too. Like I don't wanna run ads between midnight and 3 a.m. Um, on a Sunday or what have you. You can't do that in smart shopping. So you're ceding a little bit more control over to Google uh, with the smart shopping campaigns, but you're getting that sort of convenience out of it. And you're gonna have less management of that campaign in terms of your overhead of time. Um, and then finally, crucially with smart shopping, they will create these retargeting ads and show them as banner ads around the web. With smart uh, Standard shopping, you don't. So what we see is with smart shopping, you get a lot more impressions, a lot more visibility overall than in standard shopping. So um, setting up feeds is really the, the trickiest thing involved. Uh, the good news is that generally once you've done it, the feed will continue to sort of putter along and regenerate itself and you're not gonna have to do this every day or every month or every year. It's just going to you know, continue syndicating uh, once it's done. The place you should start is Google Merchant Center. So this is a, a website and it's one of Google's properties. You will log in with your same Google login that you would use for Google Ads or Google Analytics and create a Merchant Center account. Um, Again, there's the Google Ads account that's connected to Merchant Center that's connected to your store. So this is the really important link between Google Ads and your store that you need to establish for these ads to work. At a minimum, you need to create an account, which is free. Uh, you will verify and claim your domain. So usually Google will say, here's a little uh, you know, piece of code that you put in to, into your theme and then it will track you, your, you know, site and say, okay, you own the site because we gave you this and then it ended up on the site. Just verify that you actually have control over it. Um, then you'll also need to set up sh shipping rules within Google Merchant Center, just like you set them on your site. So if you have free shipping over $100 on your site, you go into the Google Merchant Center shipping and say, create a new rule and basically recreate that. Um, if you have very complex shipping settings, sometimes you do need to simplify how those are set up in Google Merchant Center versus like how you might be using a shipping app or something to do you know, really complex logic. 
or you might need to exclude items that just don't fit the bill. So maybe you sell furniture online and you need a very complicated uh, shipping setup to um, be able to get your you know, um, product shipped. If you can't replicate that same method in Google Merchant Center, and it, it's not going to match and your ads will get disproved and it won't be available. So you may not also be able to sell every single thing via Google Shopping. Um, and then you will need to create a feed. So as I mentioned, website crawl is one way to do it. Um, the only disadvantage with that is sometimes if you have things that go out of stock frequently, Google might not catch up to that right away versus if it's in a feed, they would get pinged instantly. And this is no longer in stock, stop running that ad. A spreadsheet is a method, either a Google Sheet or an upload. This is really should be reserved for folks who have very complicated product data where they just can't get it formatted correctly in any other way. Um, it's sort of a last resort. If you're selling something that's like very oversized or has a ton of different configuration options and it's just it just won't work any other way, the spreadsheet will, but I would not use it as a primary method. There's also a built-in Shopify channel integration, which we'll do a little quick demo of that um, here shortly. And there's some other apps. If you're on Shopify, um, there's an app by some process and there's GoData feed. These are services where you will pay a little bit per month, but it'll give you a bunch of sort of options in this little control panel interface that hopefully will um, make, uh, make it a little more easy for you. It's a really a convenience factor. Um, in terms of, I just saw a question in terms of physical products or service products, you can only have physical sort of shippable products in Google Shopping at the moment. Um, in terms of an order of operations, we need to claim that Google Merchant Center account first and verify that you know we own the site. Then we should go over and work on the store connection piece. And we'll link the store to Google Merchant Center and then we'll finish up in Google Merchant Center. So it's a little bit of ping pong. Basically, it's it's a chicken and egg situation where we need to be able to set up some things, you know, go over to your store, make sure that's configured, put that over in Merchant Center, verify that, and there's going to be a little back and forth. Um, the good news is that it's gotten easier over time. Um, there's a lot of different ways that if there isn't something that's right, it will be flagged for you. So for instance, here's a Google Merchant Center account where I haven't hooked up uh, anything completely yet and saying, hey, you need to verify your, your website. Uh, if I click learn more, there's a little FAQ about it. If I click verify and claim, it'll shoot me into that, um, that flow so I can get that done. It's also helpfully saying, hey, actually, there's these three things you need to do to get your shopping ads. If I click fix, it'll go through and it'll sort of walk me through the hit list. So I know it's, it's, it's daunting and it's a lot of information, but they really tried to make it more accessible um, over the years and be a little more verbose in terms of, you know, here, here's what's going on. Why aren't your ads showing? Like, here, let me show you, you need to do this thing over here. Um, a lot of the time when we talk about Google Shopping, um, it's really resolving feed errors. So once you get your feed hooked up, um, Google Merchant Center will also tell you and Google Ads will tell you, hey, there's all these things going on. This wasn't approved, that wasn't approved, this is why, here's why, et cetera. Um, and it's gonna tell you on a pretty granular level. So there's a couple of screenshots here in terms of what's happening and why. So this is, says there's a limited performance due to missing identifiers. So in other words, there's some piece of metadata I haven't specified in my feed. It's affected 39 products, um, which in this case was most of the products in this in this feed. So I really need to go forth and to figure that out. Again, there will be a little FAQs associated with that. Here's another example from somewhere else. For some reason, Google had a problem crawling the product page. It's, it's telling me this. And it's also saying, hey, for this type of product, uh, you need to define the color. So there may be certain types of products, particularly in clothing and jewelry, where you need extra information beyond what might just automatically be on your product page to define to Google in terms of categories. Uh, for jewelry, you need to have the metal color. For clothing, there needs to be um, 
a gender, you know, and a size associated, or you need to say there is no gender or there is no size, it's one size fits all. You need to sort of provide that extra layer to Google so it can correctly stack it up against all the other product feeds. Um, there could also be product schema mismatches where the information that Google sees on your site is different from the one that you're giving it. Um, and that's where something like the Google Rich Results tool could be very important. Um, and if you haven't checked that out already, I would recommend that. That's basically a way to get Google to scan your product page and say, here's what we see as a warning or here's what we, we see. And that's typically also what the shopping feed uh, would also see. And you need to make sure that those are copacetic. All right, so um, other important connections, we need to make sure that e-commerce tracking is on in Google Analytics. Hopefully if you have a store already, this is done and you're flowing through sales data into GA. Um, we also need to make sure in Google Ads that we're importing transactions into uh, Google Ads' goal. So if you haven't set up Google Ads before and you're just making for the first time, you make sure that not only are Google Ads and Google Analytics linked, but they're actually meshed together and they're sending that revenue data over so that you can tell how much revenue a product that's made in a shopping ad um, front to back. This is in tools and settings and conversions. Um, as we mentioned before, we need to link Google Merchant Center to Google Ads. So once Merchant Center is set up, we can go to tools and settings and Google Ads, linked accounts, and you'll be able to manage those connections there. And I'll just step you through. And as long as you're using the same Google login for ads as analytics and Merchant Center, you just log in as Google, it makes the associations and it links them up. So in terms of linking your the st store component, um, there's a few different ways to do this. Um, one of the sort of easiest, uh, cheapest ways to do it is through the free uh, Shopify Google Shopping connection. So what I'm gonna do is just um, hop over to that for one second. And I see there's a couple questions about that and we'll answer those shortly. Um, this is a just Google, uh, sorry, a Shopify demo store. If I wanna add a shopping link to this through the free sort of direct Google integration, I'll go to settings. I would go to sales channels and I'm just gonna add a sales channel. I see that there's Google, it says reach shoppers and get discovered across Google. Yes. When I do that, you'll see that Google is showing, gonna show up as a uh, sales channel. And what that means is that this is going to link Shopify and Google together so that Google can read the information and automatically generate a feed based on what's already in Shopify. So I'm gonna grant the permissions for that. At this point, we'll need to connect a Google account and then I'll show you some screenshots of how that looks when it's all connected. Um, when Once you've done that and that setup is complete, you'll see that the uh, product now, if you were to go into it, actually has a Google sales channel as an option. So if I had a product and I did not want it to be associated with my shopping fee and I didn't want to advertise it, I would uncheck it and save that and it would be ineligible for the feed. So you also have a granular level of control on your store side to say, these are things I want, these are things I don't. Typically you do this for a gift card, you do this for any kind of sort of temporary special products. Again, those products that might not be easily shippable, virtual products, et cetera. Um, and that's really the, the crux of it. It's pretty simple. Now, the catch is that it doesn't necessarily work for all types of products. Um, and it can be a little tricky to get that to go. So what I'm gonna do is gonna show you some examples. Once I've linked an account, this is what it would look like. So it would say that I'm eligible for free listings. It's gonna show me my Google account. It's gonna allow me to connect my Merchant Center ID here. And it's gonna say 
you know, how my shipping settings are set up. So if your ship, shipping settings are fairly simple in Shopify, you can actually get them to auto sync with this um, to Merchant Center. Um, and it's gonna flag you if you need terms and conditions as well. Um, so I had a question about if we use the Shopify integration with the product inventory in Google Shopping match the current inventory in our Shopify store at all times. Um, yes, in a manner of speaking. So Google actually doesn't care whether you have um, 20 units of your product or one unit, as long as there's something to sell. Google will not actually track the individual stock count. As long as it's something is available to sell, Google will run it. And once it's out of stock, it'll stop. Um, so in a sense that Google won't track your exact inventory levels in real time, but if we sell something in Shopify and that goes out of stock, this will get fed via the sales channel um, or an app if you're using an app and that will send it along to Google pretty much in real time. I uh, also had another question about, uh, does each size and color have a feed? I was confused by size info when to enter the data. Um, if I have different sizes, should I have them separate in the data feed? I'm gonna show you that in just one second. Um, so looking at this, we can see there's a sort of general overview settings. These are things you do pretty much once and you know, you're not gonna need to do a lot. Um, but once you're complete with this integration, it's gonna show you, hey, you have these products are approved or maybe you just did it, they're pending or these ones aren't approved. And then you can hit manage availability. And what that'll do in the Google Shopping and Shopify integration is come up with a bulk editor. And you can see, actually, here's an example of a product uh, clothing that has sizing. You can see that because I've set up the sizing as a variance um, with this product, there's only one product listing for this product. It's not separate by product. If for some reason I'm selling a small as a completely separate product, a medium as a completely separate product, um, we would not need to configure the, uh, the, the sizing or anything else on a, on a sort of variant level. You can see here, if I make a change, it's gonna do it for the entire product regardless of those variants. Um, so it's saying adult, uh, sorry, the age group is adult, the gender is male, product category, I could put outerwear, you know, and that's all gonna be for, cover everything with that variant. Um, it might be split on color. So these, this is blue, this is gray. Um, because I've split these out on the storefront by color, for each color, I would need to do this and set it separately, but it should encompass all the variants of that product, including, including sizing without having a separate definition for that. Okay. So um, in terms of the strategy for um, managing this, you know, how, how does this work and, and how do we manage these? Um, there's really a, a, a few key considerations in terms of how these are different from other types of ads. Um, oops, actually, maybe that slide is out of order. Sorry about that. <laughs> So how do we manage them? Um, I was gonna say something else. So number one, we need to create a shopping campaign. Um, there's no ad copy. There's no image selection. There's no landing pages. You can't say, hey, go to this page. Whatever your product URL is, that's what the ad's gonna have. Whatever your primary product photo is gonna be, that's the photo that's gonna appear. Um, you can't write a new description and say, hey, uh, why don't you show this instead or write a new title? It's, it's going to take from what you have on your site on a fairly one-to-one -one basis. Um, you're not gonna craft an ad that's unique to that product like you would for, for Facebook or for Google search or for anything else. Um, we would do this in AdWords. Um, and again, for privacy reasons, I can't show you a sort of a, a live account, unfortunately, but um, basically, what we do is in Google Ads, we just say create a new campaign, and this would this is what would pop up. Um, we'd say, ironically, we'd have to select create a campaign without a goals guidance because it actually makes a lot simpler. Um, otherwise, they're going to walk you through and try to sign you up for every little thing under the sun. We don't want that. We know what we want. We want our shopping campaign. So we click create a campaign. You'll see these campaign types pop up. 
and we want to create a shopping campaign. So we'd hit continue. And on the next screen, it's going to say, hey, what do you want the goal to be? So again, if you have imported those transactions or those purchases from Google Analytics into Google Ads before you do this, you're going to see that the purchases are really the main goal. Now, you might have other goals set up on your site, like a newsletter sign up or a form submit or something of that nature. But by and large, with e-commerce, be all end all is sales. And you also want uh, that to be your primary focus for a shopping campaign because it's all about uh, direct revenue. So our goal would be, in this case, purchases. Um, you wouldn't want to add newsletter sign up or something in this context. Mm -hmm. It's going to ask about our Merchant Center account. Um, if it detects that one has been linked already, it's going to pop up here, and we just make sure it's the right one. If not, prompt us to link it, log in, and connect the two. Um, we're going to select our country, which presumably is the United States. And then here's the toggle in which we have the chance to do a smart shopping campaign versus a standard shopping campaign. Um, the there's not a way to set up one and switch to the other. You'd have to make a new campaign. Um, although in a shopping campaign, it's not a big deal. If you've already done Merchant Center, you've already done that stuff. You, you can actually make multiple types of shopping campaigns and run both as long as the same products aren't in both, if they're a separate set of products in one versus the other. For now, we'll, we'll assume if you're just starting out, smart shopping is going to handle a lot of the complexity for you. And it's actually probably a better starting place over time. If you want to optimize your performance, get more granular, and there's certain things that are pain points in smart shopping, you could recreate or switch in standard. On the following screen, it's going to prompt us to say, hey, what do you want to call the campaign? Call it, you know, your company smart shopping. We can choose our bidding here. Do we want to just say, hey, however many sales you can get and for our, as much money as possible, go do that. That's basically maximize conversion value. Um, or we can say, hey, I want a specific return on ad spend. I want to spend you know, $20 per sale no matter what. I'd click this box and type that in. The problem is that's going to be on a campaign level. So if you are selling some, uh, some products that are $20 and some products that are $1,000, putting in a single target row is not going to be great because then you might spend $20 to get a $20 sale or you might, you know, uh, you might get a $1,000 sale out of it. It's going to be wildly across the board, um, which we uh, ultimately just won't, won't be effective, essentially. Um, the other thing you're going to do is put in a daily budget, like almost all other Google ad campaign types. We want to put in the amount that we're willing to spend per day, knowing that there's some float with that. So on a weekday, maybe uh, it won't spend that much. On the weekend, it might need more. Uh, also, in a super high volume period like uh, Black Friday or something like that, Google might choose to overspend that budget a bit as well for that day. So you need to know it's not exact. Hey, if I put in $30, not necessarily going to be $30. It could be 32, it could be 17. That's at least supposed to be the max that you'd be willing to spend um, per day. And then you're going to just divide by 30 or 31 or what have you to get here sort of monthly budget. So most people approach budgets on a monthly basis. And then we just split that into a daily budget. The other thing that allows us to do is let's say you're having a sale the second half of the month and not in the first half of the month. Well, I might want to sort of take my monthly budget and uh, backload it. So I might want to spend less than the total sort of pacing for the month in the front of the month because there's no sale and overspend on the back half of the month where I'm going to actually have a promotion. I'm going to expect more higher conversion rate, more volume, et cetera. Um, there's also a new customer acquisition um, option, which um, is really going to say, you know, basically how much retargeting do you want to do with this? Because if you're using smart shopping, there's going to be a mix of retargeting and new acquisition. Acquisition. If you're saying I really just want to primarily focus on new acquisition, the algorithm will take that into account. Um, 
to the best that Google knows if they've been a customer or not. Um, and then we can put our, our start and end dates as well. Um, and that's kind of it in terms of the setup. There's not a lot more nuance to it. It's really all about feed management. Um, have a couple questions, just hop over and ask, uh, sorry, answer. Um, so can you do a smart shopping campaign targeting another country like Japan and from your Japanese language Shopify? Um, I have not run a shopping campaign in Japan specifically, so I can't say off the cuff. Um, I imagine that if you had a Japanese language store that you'd be able to create a store feed, but how shopping works in each country is or can be different uh, because Google doesn't necessarily roll out all the features to every country in the same way or they have the same settings. Um, so that's something I'd have to research further. Um, shopping is available internationally, but again, EU has different rules for it as well in terms of consumer protection and options and you know what you have to uh, disclose in your feed and so forth. So uh, localization um, would be necessary. I would say that it would be best to have a separate store though. I think you would probably have problems if you did not have a Japanese language store and were trying to syndicate a feed in. Um, have another question. I get a lot of error messages for no size info. Uh, so clothing with several size variants or one size fit all on Shopify size data is optional. Um, how do I fix that? So if you're getting flagged for having no size data, it usually would mean uh, of one of a few things. I mean, one is that you can, the more data you provide to Google, if you have apparel, the sort of better. So if you are able to add the product categories, if you're able to flag um, the types of sizing, the sizing options, et cetera, um, in the feed, and then the more verbose you get and the more time you spend kind of inputting that into the Google Shopping channel or into your feed app, the better. If you're getting errors on sizing, I wonder if your variant is actually called size or it's called something else. So that's something in apparel, sometimes the option might be called length or width or waist size or you know so forth. Um, um, I would also make sure that the label of that variant is clear and see if you can map that using your feed app or your merchant center. Uh, account to uh, to help clarify that with Google. I think it might be a naming issue potentially. Um, the other thing to know in terms of where you would do something, I would say uh, primarily you'd try to resolve any feed errors within sort of Shopify and whatever the link is to Google Merchant Center because that's just going to give you a consolidated place to go through where you you have the products in front of you. You're going to just do it right there and pull from that and it'll be easier. But there also are a lot of things that you can do in Google Merchant Center where you can write rules that make exceptions for maybe that one size fits all type of product and saying, hey, if you know variant name contains this, then map it to this app attribute. And then whenever your feed gets ingested, Google will take that feed, it'll run through your little exception rule list and then it'll apply them to everything before then it processes it. And so that might be a way that you could also resolve things um, in, in sort of in bulk. Um, but I do recommend it sort of on the product level if it's possible. So um, oh, we, we have a yes. couple questions in the chat actually too. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, so the first see. one says, do domains like Square site work? My new website is under Square. I don't have a Shopify store. Um, Square, unfortunately, is an extremely limited platform that is um, really behind the curve in terms of everything else in e-commerce. Honestly, it doesn't integrate well with much, and it therefore it doesn't play nicely with other platforms and so forth. So um, you're not likely to be able to do any kind of shopping feed with a with a Square site, um, unfortunately. And the um, second one is just notice that all my internal discount codes were sent to Google Merchant Center under marketing promotions. Should I be concerned? 
Yes. Um, should not be auto syndicating discount codes. Um, I would try to find that and turn that off. Um, usually, typically the setup would be that we would need, actually need to go and set up a promotion extension within Google Ads in order to tell Google that there is a promotion. Um, so I'm not sure what you're using for your feed setup, but I would try to find a way to turn that off so it's not auto syndicating anything. Um, because to your point, if you make a you know, 30% uh, off code for customer service reason or uh, friends and family sale, you don't want that going. And so I would definitely try to kill that. Great. And I use Vend HQ for my POS and Big Commerce for my online. Will this work? So for um, for Big Commerce, there are, there are ways to create feeds and syndicate those out. Um, so if uh, I would just start, I don't, uh, some, some of the same companies are involved in terms of like Shopify or Magento and BigCommerce. Some are different. I would just start by uh, Googling BigCommerce Google Shopping Feed app or something of that nature and just see what the options are. Um, uh, but since BigCommerce does have its own app ecosystem, um, it does have abilities to hook in and you know auto feed things. So th there's definitely ways to do that. Although that's all the questions we have for now. Cool. Um, so yeah, and then I guess when in the last few slides, I just wanted to go through some of the approaches to managing the ads and the feed. Um, really, the ads are the just the products themselves. And um, number one, we really want to make uh, sure that we pay attention to product level performance. So. When you set up your campaign in Google Ads and you've run it, um, instead of going to you know campaigns and ads and looking what ads ran and which keywords you had and so forth, like you might do with a search campaign, instead you're going to see a, this uh, sidebar that says you know, products, diagnostics, etc. If you click on products, you'll actually be able to see which products have been uh, running in terms of their ads. Um, you'll see the actual price of the product. This is not a cost per click or anything like that. This is like what the price of the product is from the feed. Your clicks, your impressions, your CTR, your cost per click, your costs, and then also you know the uh, conversions, aka the sales, uh, the amount, you know, the revenue, et cetera. So you can look and see what your return on ad spend in on, is on a per product basis. Um, you, as with anything else in Google Ads, you can change the date range. And so you can look at a week, you could look at a month, you could look at a year, however long you've been running them. Um, and it's really important to look at this because sometimes you'll look through and you'll say, oh, this says um, not serving. And why is that? That's one of my most popular products. And there might be something that you, is an issue that hasn't been flagged elsewhere, you missed the notification on or something. There's something about it where it's actually not running as ad, or maybe it's out of budget. and what happens is you can see out of these ornaments that are on screen, you know, there's one that got 10 times the volume of another. Maybe you actually don't want this ornament to be taking all, all of the impressions. You want to try to divvy things up. So you'll need to, you might want to disable a product or throttle something and sort of shift how, you know, which ones are uh, getting impressions because what Google does with the Google Shopping algorithm, if it finds that people are interested in sees signals on the web in terms of the response to something, or maybe there's a spike in terms of the type of product you have and there's a lot of volume on that, um, it's gonna sort of go, go where the volume is, but that might not exactly align with where your priorities are for your business in terms of the types of uh, product categories that you wanna sell or really focus on or where your inventory is, for instance, because again, we can have one of these left and this is getting a ton of impressions and we might have uh, a thousand of these other ones and they're not getting any. So you may wanna rejigger things based on your product mix. Um, and you probably wanna do that weekly if you have a lot of products or a lot of volume and you're um, seeing good returns and spending a lot on Google shopping, you wanna do that more frequently, um, but at least on a monthly basis and hopefully at least every other week. Um, so paying, paying attention to products uh, at a product level is really important. 
The other thing is, um, you, you know, you'll get some Merchant Center notifications. You might get an email from there. You might get something popping up in Google Ads in another place, but you should also be looking at the Diagnostics tab within products in your shopping campaign and Google Ads. Um, you can see here, these are the ready to serve, the not ready to serve, things that might have limitations, things that are excluded, et cetera. So again, these 1600 products, these are ones that we've specifically chosen to not run shopping ads for. And that's fine, there's this not really an error. We should also know what's excluded and what's not. You might exclude something for seasonality. Um, say you're selling uh, winter you know, wool sweaters right now. Well, come um, you know, March or maybe May, you're not going to want to focus a lot of, of re revenue on that or a lot of ads on that, right? So you might exclude them during the summer months. Or you might have um, a type of product where, you, hey, it's on a 12-week back order with a manufacturer. I just need to exclude it until it comes back. Don't want it you know, cluttering up the feed, et cetera make exclusion, but you'll also want to revisit that. So this is a good place to have at a glance sort of what's the health and sort of pulse of your campaigns. Um, and it'll show you an aggregate if there's anything else that maybe you missed somewhere else. Um, and then really the nuance and the sort of art of Google Shopping is slicing and dicing and grouping and regrouping your products. So. I know for most folks, the biggest hurdle is getting the feed in, getting it approved, just get, you know, getting all this stuff linked up is, is a lot of work, obviously. Um, but in the long term, as you run ads, the more that you create associations and groupings between products and in Merchant Center or in Google Ads, the more control you have over how that money is spent and to what extent, and the more you'll have a clear picture on how to optimize. So if I didn't group anything anything in this catalog, this is a, obviously a jewelry catalog, and I, I didn't subdivide these, these are all manual groupings that we've made. I would just say, oh, there's 35,000 impressions, 252 clicks, excuse me. This is my conversion rate. Um, and this is sort of like how all of it did. And that might be good. There might be a you know good return, and on a top line level, I'm still making money and I'm you know having a good revenue positive campaign. But I wouldn't really know at a glance without looking at every single product as we saw in that previous view, what um, is actually working, what's not. You can see here, men's rings was excluded because uh, in a previous analysis and a previous date range to the screenshot the uh, return on investment had had dropped and it wasn't revenue positive. So, so you know, let's take a breather on that for a while. Um, we've in the past found that there was a breakout performance on money clips certain times of the year for gifting. So we want to look at that separately. We want to see women's rings separately because those sell way differently than men's rings. And um, necklaces and pendants, well, you can have a pendant necklace and so on and so forth, but to have things at a more granular level, we can understand what's happening, what's getting the most impressions, what costs the most. You can see that our cost per click also, our cost per conversion is gonna be different for a lot of these. Um, and it's just really important to, to know that so you can optimize for that. It'll help you split out things that aren't working and throttle those or turn those off. And it'll help you amplify the ones that are and creating more market share for those as well. Um, and yes, it is kind of a pain to go through and you click through your product catalog and make these associations and write these rules and figure out all this stuff. It's definitely uh, tedious, uh, but ultimately it's how you can really dig in and get them the most value for your ad spend. Um, Google shopping campaigns are, are not about the art of copywriting. They're not about um, you know, having great creative. They are somewhat about, you know, product photography. You still need to have eye-catching photos and you should be thinking about, especially if you have a retail product that you don't make that other people carry, what does your product photo look like versus other people? If you have a better looking product photo, I'm looking at 10 different, uh, you know, frying pans and this one looks better, more enticing for whatever reason, probably going to click on that one, even if it's the same price on other sites, right? So you want to make sure that 
we have something to offer that's unique, but the same token, when it comes to managing shopping, a lot of this gets very granular um, and it is a little tedious, but it is worth plowing through it and, and doing it. Um, and just finally, the, in terms of performance considerations, what we talk about and talk about success with Google Shopping, we wanna make sure that we're paying attention to our margins and knowing what those are and making sure there's a good return on ad spend. Um, as with any type of ad, um, you know, we want to be thinking about that, but especially with product ads where different products have different margins and, and you know, spending a certain amount on one product might make sense to acquire a customer and on another, it might not. Competition, your costs will vary wildly. So um, how many folks have the same product or same types of products that you have if you're in a very crowded segment? your Google Shopping ad costs might be a lot higher. Conversely, if you have something that not a lot of people sell online or it's more niche or specialty, you're more likely to have a better cost per click and have overall better return. Um, related to that, if you are producing goods and you're wholesaling them to other people, if those people are competing with you, um, that's gonna drive your costs up. But it's also important to think about the fact that like if you don't have Google Shopping ads, even if you have a direct to consumer site, but the folks who are wholesaling your goods do, well, in reality, a lot of times they're getting a lot of visibility and you could actually have more direct sales if you are in this mix. Um, and a lot of times if, if people know that you could get it direct, there might be advantages of that. There might be a warranty advantage or maybe a shipping advantage or just the overall trust in the brand. The larger your catalog is, the larger the challenge is going to be to manage the information. If you have 10 products, it's going to be pretty, pretty quick. If you have 1,000 products, 10,000 SKUs, it's going to take a while to sort through and manage those. So your campaign will likely scale with the size of your own product catalog. Um, also, if your inventory turns over a lot, let's say you're a vintage clothing shop and you have one but only one of every single thing you sell. There's gonna be a huge amount of churn in terms of things going, coming online because you're getting new inventory, them going out of stock, pulling things on and off and on and off. And it's gonna be a lot more management of a feed versus if you warehouse something, you have a thousand units, that product is just gonna be in the feed and keep running um, for a really long time. And then I'll, uh, finally, I'll also say it, it might be worth it uh, even if you don't you think your category might not be a, a hot category with Google Shopping, it's worth trying lower dollar value niche products, uh, particularly looking here to like food manufacturers and folks who might have a snack pack that's $5, $10, et cetera. You think, well, why would I put that in my Google Shopping feed? We've seen examples where someone's searching for something in a in a, that's a specialty, and really there's not a lot of places to buy it on the web. They will totally click on a product to add for something that's inexpensive and then work to build a cart that hits your minimum free shipping value. Let's say that's $40, $50, even just to get that one product. And then you've acquired a new customer and you've gotten actually a lot more sales out of it than you anticipated. And probably the competition for that search is pretty low. So your cost per click is pretty low and you can actually do it profitably. It's possible. Um, so you know, uh, if you have a feed, I also wouldn't start super limited or see what the response is to your whole range of products. And if things then aren't revenue positive or they aren't working and for whatever reason, you can narrow them down, but don't um, write off things off the bat. And I think that pretty much wraps it for time. And I know we took questions in line pretty much. Um, just wanted to drop also um, our contact info for, for Hidden Gears. As I mentioned, we're a Google partner and Shopify experts um, as well. Um, I know it's, a, it's hopefully this is enough so you can get an orientation and entry into wrapping your brain around all the different pieces. I'm guessing you probably have to still Google around a little bit to make some more connections, but hopefully this, this served you well in terms of knowing uh, a direction to go. And, um, get going with Google Shopping. Great, thank you so much, Paolo. Sure. So um, the next webinar in our e-commerce and digital marketing series is Internationalization to Japan, Product Localization on Thursday, January 27 at noon. Namiko Kajiwara, Food Innovation Consultant, will be talking about the key factors of product localization 
using real life in a, um, examples from clients she has worked with. So we can we hope you can join us for that webinar. Um, so please visit our website, htdc.org slash e-commerce to sign up for this and other upcoming webinars and to view um, recordings of the past webinars. So thank you, Paolo, and thanks everyone for joining us today. And if you're interested in services from Innovate Hawaii, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Mahalo. <laughs>